If you had asked me that question when I was about 10 years old, my answer would have been, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Captain James T. Kirk of the Starship Enterprise. Like many children born in the early 60s, I sat glued to the television set whenever Star Trek came on. And for a long time, Captain James T. Kirk was my example of leadership. He wasn't the smartest of his crew. Spock knew more about science. Scotty knew more about engineering. And Bones knew more about medicine. But what Captain Kirk brought to the table was leadership. His crew would have followed him to the ends of the universe. Actually, I think they did. How do you give compliments? Now, who can tell me what this is? A what? It's a sandwich, but what? what? Well, someone here got it right. It, it is often called a compliment sandwich because you're often told, you know, to soften the blow of a criticism. You can put it in between the fluffy buns of a compliment. Well, how do you feel when someone does that? When you know they really just want to deliver the criticism? Yeah. They're chicken. Did someone say that? They're chicken when they do that, of course. So I'm going to suggest that you do not give a criticism sandwich. What you might want to consider is upping your ratio of compliments to criticism or feedback that's maybe less than positive. Several years ago, in 1992, researcher John Gottman had a hypothesis that in marriage relationships, if there were at least five positives to every one negative, that the marriage would survive and thrive. But as that ratio went down to one to one, there was a cascade toward divorce. He decided to test that hypothesis, and he brought in 700 newlywed couples and videotaped a 15-minute conversation that was just on ordinary things. He then had his team of researchers review the videotapes and simply come up with the ratio of positive comments or gestures to negative comments or gestures, and based on that ratio, predict whether the couple would be together in 10 years. How accurate do you think their predictions were? Any guesses? 80%. 80%, 100%, 75%. A hundred percent is closer. It was actually 94% accuracy based on a 15-minute conversation of newlyweds. <laughs> now, when it comes to work environments, maybe you don't need to have a compliment sandwich quite this big with five to one as the ratio, because more recent research by Dr. Barbara Fredrickson has shown that in work teams, if you have at least a three to one ratio, that the work team is much more productive. Now you might be wondering, is it possible to be too positive? Do you think it's possible to be too positive? Yes. 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 And you're right if you said yes. If you approach 12 to one or more, then productivity actually starts taking a nosedive. But let me guess, where you work, <laughs> Too much positivity is probably not a problem, right? I'm probably three or four in this picture. But it was when I was six years old. It was 1968, Christmas Eve. I still believed in Santa Claus. And we were on the way to the family Christmas party. My mother's side of the family. We'd driven all the way from Grand Forks, North Dakota to Pueblo, Colorado, just in time. Santa Claus was handing out the gifts, calling each child's name, and as it got closer and closer to my turn, my hand was squeezing my grandmother's hand, and finally, the last gift, my gift, and Santa Claus raised it up high, called out, ho, 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 Teresa Coffee. What? I felt like I'd been sucker punched. Has that ever happened to you, that someone else got something you deserved? like a promotion or a job? Well, that's how I felt. After I recovered from the shock, I looked up at my nana, my big Italian grandma, and I said, Santa forgot me! 
and my Nana scooped me up in those fleshy arms, arms that every morning rolled out ravioli at an Italian restaurant and said, oh no, Santa did not forget you. And she passed me off to my parents who tried to shield me from what grandma was doing, but I saw her work the crowd and I saw her get her younger brothers to work the crowd too, <laughs> my great uncles. Well, a few minutes later, a sheepish looking Santa Claus approached me. Little Diane Williams, I'm sorry, your gift was stuck at the bottom of my bag. And with a flourish, he pulled out a wad of bills, 50 bucks. <laughs> A small fortune to a six-year-old in 1968. Well, the tears vanished, and I looked over at my Nana, and she was smiling like a Cheshire cat. <laughs> my grandmother taught me a couple of important lessons that day. The first was that it pays to have mafia connections. <laughs> well, it does pay to have influential people in your life. And the second was the importance of being a champion for the underdog. My grandmother knew that. And many years later, at her funeral, the pews were packed and person after person stood up to tell how my grandmother had helped them when they were down and out, how she'd been their champion and made a difference in her life. Well, my grandmother was not a wealthy woman, but she was a wise woman. She was a champion of the underdog. So take that lesson from my grandmother. Apply it to the people you work with. Not like you're going to always be their savior, because that's not empowering. But once in a while, give people hope when they've lost hope by being their champion. Imagine, go back in time with me a little bit, that there's an old woman sitting in this chair. I handed the old woman the Arby's bag. She peered inside. I, I wanted the big roast beef sandwich. This, this one is puny and hard as a rock, too. <laughs> well, that was the big roast beef sandwich. The choices were the big roast beef sandwich, the bigger roast beef sandwich, and the biggest roast beef sandwich. You asked for a big roast beef sandwich. I just got you what you asked for. It's, it's not what I wanted, though. <sighs> the old woman was cranky. She was demanding. She was my mother. <laughs> and she really wasn't that old. She was 68 years old and afflicted with multiple myeloma, a cancer of the blood. And she'd come to live with my family late in 2006. We had a lot of conversations like the one about the Arby sandwich. And I realized later that I was responding to her from my logical self. I was listening logically. What I really needed to do was to learn to listen from my heart. So how do you listen from your heart? The first thing to do is to empty your ego. Oh, that's so hard. To let go of assumptions to let go of agendas, to let go of the need to be right. I had assumed that my mother's request for a sandwich was all about hunger. So I, my agenda, was simply to bring her back what she asked for. I was right. I brought her back exactly what she asked for. She should be grateful. But I wasn't listening with my heart. Maybe I needed to respond with a little more grace. I needed to listen empathetically, to listen to understand, to seek to understand before seeking to be understood. If I had thought about my mother's position, she had lost just about everything. She'd lost her home, she'd lost her community, she'd lost her car, she lost her job, she lost all her cats save one. She couldn't even get a fast food sandwich that she wanted because she was so dependent on me. Her wanting a specific sandwich really wasn't about hunger or the size of a sandwich. It reflected a deeper pain. And it would have been helpful if I had listened reflectively where she would have felt that I understood her, even by 
saying back some of her own words, like, well, it is a pretty puny sandwich. You know, if someone lets you know that they've understood because they repeat back, it makes you feel like, oh, someone gets me finally. Listening from the heart. It's easy to say, but not so easy to do. My mother helped me get better at listening from the heart. After a few months, she had to go to a nursing home where I would visit her a few times a week. Well, on one of the last visits, actually the last visit, I walked into her room and there she was laying in bed. Her breathing was labored and her body was covered with black sores. Just the day before I'd signed the DNR, do not resuscitate, the DNI, do not intubate, I'd signed her up for hospice and I'd written her obituary, dutiful daughter that I am, and I thought she'd like to hear what I'd written in her obituary. She might be curious, so I brought it with me. She was not interested. I don't know if you've ever been around someone who's dying, but often as their body shuts down, they begin to shut down and shut people out. There really wasn't anything more to say, or so I thought. So as I left that day, and almost had the door closed behind me. I heard her voice, Di? That was her nickname for me, Di. Yes, Mom? Di, I love you. That was what needed to be said. That was what was unfinished. My mother had listened from her heart and heard what I didn't know how to say. And those were her last words to me, great last words.